All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm also joined by a fellow Californian here, Eileen McDark. How are you doing, Eileen? I'm, I'm great. I'm just yeah. great. The, the sun is shining and my birds are eating in the bird feeder, so I'm happy. Oh, it's always good. Love this hummingbird season, especially. I love yes. here we get yeah. so many hummingbirds. It's always great to, to watch them. And Eileen is the CEO of the Resiliency Group, but she has this great new book coming out, and I think an extremely timely new book coming out on August 4th, I think it is. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, yes. called Bur Burnout to Breakthrough, Building Resilience to Refuel, Recharge, and Reclaim What Matters. And I, as I said, I think this is an exceptionally timely book because as we were discussing just before coming on air here, I think that during this, this crisis and pandemic, I think a lot of people are really burnt out. Yeah. I think because you know the pressures of maybe they're in an industry that's suffering, maybe their job has gone, maybe they're, maybe they're home working for the first time, maybe they're juggling their kids who aren't in school, you know, their, their, their significant other, maybe there's so many things going on that I think people are overwhelmed, burnt out. And, and kind of, uh, as we said, not really knowing what the future holds. And this, this whole combination is creating such serious stress and angst. Yeah, yeah it's, it's true. And you, I mean, you gave a, a really good thumbnail of, of the context in which we find ourselves. And what's so interesting, John, is that um, I wrote this book because the last two, three years, my field is resiliency, but when groups would bring me in, um, or I'd be keynoting a conference, mm -hmm. it was in the context of overcoming burnout with resilience. Well, May of last year, the World Health Organization finally declared burnout to be an, a global occupational hazard. So, so I said, you know what? I need to write this book. So that was like a, a, literally a year to the date that I got the contract. So come all the way around, I delivered the final manuscript in December. Now we are in July. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought two months after I delivered that, that we would all be blindsided by this, this convergence of so many pieces of negativity, uh, a pandemic that we've never, the likes of which we've never seen. It doesn't have a long track record. We don't know where it's going to go. Now we have, we have all this economic up and down. We have people... You know, they're saying now in California, John, they're saying we might have to have another lockdown, you know, mm -hmm. where we are stuck. So there's a whole lot that's going on that, um, that we never took into account. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I said, I, I, and, and absolutely. And I think that's where sometimes the universe works in mysterious ways, doesn't it, Eileen? Because I think your, your, the timing of your book is, is incredibly important. Because if you think of, if you think about there was all that burnout happening before this. Now you, you, you layer on all of this. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I think we're in a period of extreme stress. And I think the hardest thing for, for most people is they don't have a roadmap to get out of it, right? They don't have a roadmap, even a personal roadmap or a professional roadmap, which is why I think it's incredibly important what you're doing. Well, let's, let's talk about that idea of a roadmap. And um, the truth of the matter is, Life has never given us a definite roadmap. We like mm -hmm. to think it has, yeah. but it hasn't. And I just, I just got something from a, from a colleague um, uh, who, who wrote another book about dis disruption and the digital world. And he did some, some history. And he went back to literally, you know, times before the Middle Ages in which there were these, I mean, we think this is the worst world. Sure. It was far worse. And mm -hmm. what he was coming up with as he did some parallels and he looked at these events that were, you know, where the Roman Empire, this happened, mm -hmm. and, and then there was the bubonic plague and all this other stuff, that actually out of that came positive things. Mm -hmm. Because what we're, what, I mean, I really think this is true, that the individuals and the organizations that will actually end up coming out of this and thriving are the ones that are saying, I'll create, I'll create my own roadmap, but I can't do it for the next five years. Maybe yeah. I can do it for the next five days. Mm -hmm. And we begin to listen in, in deeper, in deeper, better ways. 
And so I, th I think one of our, one of our tasks um, individually first is when everything is out of seemingly out of our control is to say, where is it that I have control? Mm -hmm. And where we do have control is today. This is it, John. I don't know if I'm going to get to talk to you tomorrow. Right. All I have is this day. And yeah. so what do I do with this day? And how can I accept the fact that some patterns might be broken? But what are, and what's really important? Because we get, we get stuck up on these little tiny things. And let me give you an idea about how we can suddenly spiral down. We're mentally, okay, here's where we get depressed, anxious, mm -hmm. confused, exhausted, which is really what burnout is all about. We, yep. we no longer have the mental, emotional, physical energy to keep on. And it was a funny little incident, and it just hit me. For 20 plus years, on my bathroom counter, I've had a clock uh, that you put a battery in it, and it was just fine, and I could, it was big enough, and I could see it, and how much time do I have before I have to, you know, get on a plane or do whatever. And then just last week, I dropped the clock. When I say it broke, let me put it this. God and all of his <laughs> angels could never put that clock back together again. It is just gone. Well, John, there was a pattern. And I was used to 20 plus years looking for that clock, looking for the clock. It is gone. Mm -hmm. And I realized if I get that hung up on a clock, yeah. where is it that I might get to wanting other patterns and it's gone. So the question is, number one, is it necessary to have it there? Mm -hmm. Was that really a necessary pattern? Because right. some of the things that you and I do are no longer necessary. Yeah, we do yeah. it because it's rote, because it's programmed, but it's not necessary. And number two, if, if it is something that's important, how do I replace it? You mm -hmm. know what I, what I yeah. got, John? I'd forgotten I had it. It's an old-fashioned wind-up clock. Beautiful. When was the last time you ever saw a clock that you wound up? Um, ooh, it's a long time ago, but you know something, there is something, there, there used to be something lovely about winding up a clock and hearing that noise and then trying to figure out when you got to the end point so you didn't actually break it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's just, it was such a, it's, it, I, I believe the, the world gives us all kinds of lessons and sure. most of the time they're metaphors if we pay attention to them. And mm -hmm. the fact that I had to go find this clock and I went back to, quote, old technology mm -hmm. that actually is easier and cheaper than having to replace a battery in this clock every time. Mm -hmm. So one of my thoughts for all of us is in this day, are there some patterns, some ways of doing things that if I really, if I really ask myself the critical questions, is this really true? How do I know this is really true? What would happen if I substituted something else? Something else that might be simpler, easier. Mm -hmm. And what's the other thing that's fascinating, John, and I'm, I'm picking this up from some of my colleagues in human resources, is that you know we've, we've been very concerned about employee engagement. We've talked about employee engagement mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. Now that we are communicating via remotely, Zoom, LinkedIn, um, the levels of engagement are going up. Yep. And, and let me tell you why I think this is now, this is not obviously universal, but mm -hmm. if anyone's listening to this and is a manager, I want you to think about this. For the first time, I am actually looking, we're looking at each other. Yes. Oftentimes in our businesses, we move at such a pace, the door is closed if I happen to have a door, or you're somewhere over here, so I never see you because you're based in China and I'm in California. Now all of a sudden, I'm looking at you. And the wise manager is first and foremost checking in with everyone. So yes. how are you doing today? You know, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's the best thing that happened with your family over the weekend? Um, we, we begin to communicate on more personal levels yeah, that you know, brings the whole person in. 
You know what's really interesting about that, Eileen, because we as a company have been doing this for six or seven years now, but we made a strategic decision to be a largely virtual organization for a, for a lot of different reasons. And that was the first fascinating thing that I discovered when we did this, because I, when I ran organizations a number of years back, I was, I'm like the reform smoker of virtual working, right? Because I hated, I didn't want anybody. I wanted everybody in the office. If they were lived in, if they could get into the office, I wanted them in the office because I did not believe in remote working. And then, you know, flip it to where I started this. And then I realized, oh my goodness, the, as you said, the level of engagement goes up, productivity goes up if you do it properly. And then I started to realize that I had better relationships and engagement with some people who I never actually met, who I'd never met yet. And I'm thinking back, and then I'm thinking back to these, I, there were times when I had people who were sitting 10 feet away from me and I didn't really know them or, or really engage with them that much. And so, yeah, it's been, it, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing that this, virtual um, world can actually become that much more engaging because yeah i think it's because if you make a, if you make more of an effort but also because it's very personal and i think that's the thing that a lot of people miss it's very very personal yeah yeah the, when you think about it i mean even our setting okay so right now i've invited you into my office yeah. Um, and you can see that behind me, I have, you know, I have, well, you can't really see there. There are some of the books. Yeah. Oh, I don't know which way I go. Yeah. There, there's, yeah. there's books, there's plaques, there's pictures of my kids over there. There's a Kuan Yin statue. Um, things that tell you a little bit about me that you would have no idea. Mm -hmm. And if I had a puppy dog that came running in and jumped on my lap, you would meet my puppy dog. And um, while it is going to cause some flexibility as the kids come running in, you know, and say XXX, the, the smart manager acknowledges now, finally, which my first book was called Work for a Living and Still Be Free to Live, and it was in 1984 when it came out, mm -hmm. is that we do not have separate office, separate home, that it is a blend, and it is the way we blend this. And now, this working from home has created this blend. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and, and that's and, and absolutely created this blend. But I think it's also showed that if you can do it, if your organization or your business uh, allows it, or, uh, lends itself to it, right, it's feasible, um, then you, you start to open the whole world to having people live where they want to live, have the, you know, live. Why force, I, I, I love, I think Silicon Valley is a classic example. Why would you force people to live in such a high cost area, mm -hmm. you know, end up in, in, in little boxes, little box apartments, spending a ton of money, you know, to live there and all of that. When like open the world to have, if you want to live in a city, live in a city. If you want to live in a, in a, in a suburb, live in a suburb. If you want to live in Montana and it has good internet connection, go live in Montana. Like, but find your talent where it is and let people build their lives and integrate their lives with, with their working lives so that they're happier holistically. You know, I didn't think about that, that notion of living where you want to, but you brought up a, you brought up a really good point. And it might actually, in two ways. Number one, wouldn't it be cheaper mm -hmm. for an organization that is, I, I don't have to pay you $9 million trillion because, yep. oh my gosh, it's yep. $5,000 for a studio apartment in downtown San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you were living where you wanted to live. Now, at the same time, when all of this lockdown stuff goes away, because it will, uh -huh. we do need to have reasons to bring each other together. You sure. know, there is, I mean, there, we do like to, we do like to see each other. I'm missing mm -hmm. hugs. I love hugs. <laughs> I don't get to give hugs. Um, and we will at some point in time come together. But the, so on two levels, one is that the employee is empowered to choose where they want that, that feeds their heart. Uh, mm -hmm. And number two, the organization can also look at some, some cost benefits yeah. um, related to that. I don't, have to, I don't have to pay for the expensive transportation. Yeah. I know, you know there's, there are different things about that. Yeah, that's so a, I would really. That's a really yeah. good point. I would really encourage organizations to take a strategic look at this rather than just say, oh, 
it's something we had to do during the pandemic. And once the pandemic is over, let's get everybody back into the office and take a strategic look at it and see if, again, what are the benefits for the company? What are the benefits for the employee? All that, like do some, do some actually research on it. Don't just try and go back to the way things were, because I think this is a fantastic opportunity. And I think also getting back to the concept of, of burnout, I think this is a great time for self-reflection, right? And to assess your own, assess your own life. But here's the thing, Eileen, as, as, as I said, as you said, you know, there's no roadmap and I think people are, you know, are stressed that there's no road. But I think a lot of people don't even know how to take the first step in maybe examining and reorienting their life. So what would you suggest? What's a good first step? Like you, I mean, I love the clock metaphor because that's a great one because that the clock sort of said to you, hey, you know, you need to take a look at some things. How, yeah. do, how, do, how do people find what is the right first step to take? Well, let me offer a couple. But first one, I want to go back to this notion of not having a roadmap. I read something the other day and I thought it was fascinating is that if we see what's happening now as a journey, mm -hmm. and if you're on a journey, you, you know, you don't necessarily know where the gas station is going to be. You don't know what yeah. the hotel is going to be. You don't know where the next meal is going to be, but journeys become an adventure. Yeah. And so it's part of the adventure is, is I'm in process. I, I'm, I'm learning this. Um, so I think that's, that's just a, a very helpful metaphor. Mm -hmm. So where is it that you start? Um, and we might've had a conversation about this, John, I, I don't remember, but I think it's, it's, it's very practical. Um, you have to figure out, number one, energy is what resilience is all about. Right. Burnout right. is the, that total depletion of energy. So I want to figure out where does my energy go? Why is it at the end of the day, not only am I exhausted, I can't sleep. I'm you know, what, what has happened? So I would suggest that at least for the three days, at least for three days, Grab, grab a notebook, whatever you have, a sign pad, whatever, and make three columns. The first one says time. The second one says what. The third one says who. So it's time, what, who. And you keep a time lock. Now, don't make this a monument and a paper mache. Yeah. This is not something that you, this is, this is small. But what you want to figure out is where does this precious thing that I have called time go and i if so for just just this, i mean seven days would be ideal but you know mm -hmm. whatever because you're going to start to see patterns if i start keeping a time log okay it's you know i'm up at seven in the morning um okay so how long did it take me to get uh brush my teeth and meditate okay so at 7 a.m meditate okay that was that was 30 minutes so that's and i do it by the way almost everything you and i do comes in 15 minute increments so mm -hmm. it can be 1.25 this, this case be 0.5 is 30 minutes what am i doing okay now i i move on to another activity it just jot it down and and is there somebody who's involved and i will mm -hmm. guarantee you at the end of at least three days you take those little pieces of paper you put them on the kitchen counter you throw them on the dining room table on your desktop and you start looking at them and just say, why am I doing that? Why am I doing that? Why am I doing it that way? And when I begin to look at it, we're going to see patterns of things that come up. We're going to see patterns, for example, we're going to see patterns of people who, when I'm with them, they mentally and emotionally drain me. Yeah. And so now I get to decide, do I choose, that's a really important word, do I choose to be with that person or if they contact me, let's say we're on the phone or a Zoom, you know, I might say, you know, I have, I have another call I need to be on. And by the way, you won't be lying. There'll be always something yeah, else. Sure. Can you tell me in 25 words or less what it is I can do for you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People can do that. But you, yeah. you have to set the, see, part of it is setting boundaries. You might discover that, that one of the things that you keep getting interrupted, you, you keep jumping on that ding that says you have an email. So instead of staying focused, you snap over there. And by the way, people are not multitaskers. You might uh, think you are, we are not. 
I agree. I agree. Um, absolutely, I agree with you. I think the whole multitasking thing is um, we can't focus on a number of things at once. All we can do is do a lot of things badly or, me or mediocre. That's right. That, that's right. I mean, um, Cal, uh, what's his last name? Cal Newport. Uh, he is a professor of computer science at Georgetown. Uh, wrote a book, was called Deep Focus. And mm -hmm. his whole thing, his world is technology. His whole thing is you have to stop. You have to push away that. If you got something you want to work on it, work on it. Mm -hmm. Don't jump on the other. But the, the patterns that you will see. Um, I know years ago when I, when I came up with this concept, uh, one of the patterns I discovered was I was sitting on the board of a national association. And I realized for where I am at this point in time in my life, that's another thing. Where are you right yeah. now? For where I was right now, this wasn't important. But I, I, I had no idea how much time it was taking for me to do this. Mm -hmm. So I resigned. Right. So I, I think it's being able to step back and say, what is consuming my energy? And, 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 then, and, it, and, I would say, and the inputs, because if you think about it, Eileen, so say, say if I go through my list later and I suddenly say, <clears throat> suddenly see, I'm spending an awful lot of time during the day checking the news, checking the virus news, checking this, checking that, getting myself more and more up, you know, worked up or depressed about everything. Then you have to ask yourself, okay, do I really need to check the news like every hour or two? I mean, you know, can I, you know, maybe leave that to the evening? If you even, I mean, to be honest, I'm of the belief now that we're get so overwhelmed with this stuff that. If, if something, if a, if a meteor is heading towards my house, one of my neighbors will let me know, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but look at the inputs because I absolutely agree with you on energy. And I think energy is depleted very quickly by the input. So you've got to be very careful about what you're inputting into your brain. How, what habits are you looking at? use all the time or are you your know, sports, whatever. Are you just spending your whole time on sports and therefore you're just taking all of your focus away? You know, I, I love that you, you said that because I think right now, one of the things that exhaust us is that there's so many different, it goes like this, it's left, it's right, it's center, it's this, <laughs> this is bad, this is good, do this, do this. And, you know, it's just stop, stop. Yeah. Decide, decide what voice you want to listen to and cut it, cut it out. And don't look at email before you go to bed. Don't look at the news before you, but give yourself this space. Because one of the things we know that we desperately need and your brain desperately needs it. We need as adults, we need between seven and eight hours sleep at least. Mm. And then I, what's interesting is that's one of the benefits of COVID-19 for me is that I'm not on a plane. I'm not, and I am, I, my, my goal is seven and a half hours sleep. Right. Um, and being able to slow that down because taking care of this physical body this is the engine that drives the locomotives. So instead of watching the sports, go out and hit a tennis ball against the side of your garage. Go take yeah. a walk. And we can take walks. You know, maybe, yeah. So maybe you put a mask on, but you can still be outside. You know, I'll go outside and work in my garden. Things yeah. that will renew you, because that's another question for us, is of the things that I do in the course of my day, what renews me? Yeah. And I think it's a beautiful thing about the what you said earlier, though, about, um, you know, you just mentioned going out for a walk or whatever right into your garden. And I think that, you know, pre-pandemic, you know, we have all these other things. So we're always so busy. One of the nice things I thought, I mean, if there is silver linings to these things was I saw a lot more people out walking, a lot more couples out walking, people, you know, families out walking, doing things that they probably weren't doing otherwise, just the simplicity of it, like going for a walk, getting fresh air, going out running together, whatever it is, bike, cycling together. I hope people hold on to those afterwards and then just don't go all, all split to the four winds and think, oh, I've got all my other stuff back now. I don't need to bother because there's something, I think there was something very renewing in that, um, reconnecting with simplicity and with the people around you. Mm -hmm. I, I love, love that word that you use, John, simplicity. Our lives have become incredibly cluttered. Mm -hmm. Cluttered with stuff, cluttered with to-dos, cluttered with people. And if, to come back to center, 
to come back at the at, at the very least. What is it that I mean? You know, when you begin to look at that, we don't need half the stuff we think we do. Yeah, I know. And to simplify that, and to simplify relationships. I mean, my my daughter now. What do they do at night? They do jigsaw puzzles. They yeah. play games. You know, they're not. They are, they are relating to each other in a very different way than everybody going off on the corner and looking at their smartphone. And, yeah, yeah. you know, this, it's, so, it's, it's so refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and, you know, you said that thing about walking. So every day, as much as possible, I am, I am up early and I do meditate. And then I go for a run, uh, mm -hmm. it's about five miles. And I go early in the morning before people are out. But I will see people that I, I never paid any attention. Sure. I see them now a lot. And so they might be across the street, but we say good morning to each other. Yeah. There's I'm... one woman who, uh, she and her husband, she has a, um, an oxygen tick. And she walks very slow. Well, recently, she's been without the oxygen tank. And I run by her and I just wave at her and say, good job. I don't know who she is. You should see the <laughs> smile on her face, which brings up another point. One of the things that feeds all of us is when we give something out to someone else. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't cost. I mean, Does what it, you just said, it doesn't cost. It it's just it was engaging with the world. It was, it, was, it was nothing. And then I noticed that she didn't have that oxygen. When I'm, and I'm, this isn't about me. This is saying we can all do that. Yeah. When we say, you know, I, I see you running down here and maybe she's 250 pounds, but she's out moving. Go, yeah. That's really hard. Good for you. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's, and it's, I think hopefully that is we become a little bit more encouraging to the world around us. Listen, Eileen, the time has flown um, <laughs> as usual, because Eileen always has so much to say that's uh, really of so, you know, uh, insightful and, and interesting. And the book is Burnout to Breakthrough, coming out August 4th, Building Resilience to Refuel, Recharge and Reclaim What Matters. And I think this is, if there's one thing, as I said, coming out of this pandemic, I think it's giving us the opportunity to reassess our lives, both personally and professionally. So I think it's a very timely book. I'm really looking forward to it, Eileen. Thank you, John. As always, I love our conversations. Yeah. My name is John Golden, SalesPop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.